if you think about um, you know mitigating that infrastructure lock-in risk a bit, you think about what are the things that you may take from the infrastructure provider because it's so tempting. Um, I would say keep in mind the idea it is okay to accept the lock-in to an open standard. For example, Postgres is an open standard. However, well, the details of the Postgres implementation are a different uh, topic. You may have to adapt, um, for example, the way Postgres creates backups. That's something we do for customers a lot because they cannot use off-the-shelf automation because it's not compliant with their security policies. But regardless of that, but beside of that, and Postgres is a bit of a specific example here, um, another thing that um, is problematic is user management and authentication. Where do you have your primary identity server? Some of our clients, they have it as a standalone service. So that's their primary identity server. So every customer within the internal organization has its own identity in that identity server. And then if that is integrated with the identity server provided by the infrastructure provider. So that you don't tie into the infrastructure provider's identity manager too much. And this is a best practice. If you don't have that and you, you go all in with you know, the identity management of a particular infrastructure provider, assuming it's not based on you know, standard APIs or, or any, any standard, that may also be one of the first um, problematic um, you know, decisions. Um, for the n 9 platform, we come up with n 9 UAA, which introduces, for example, a tenant concept that is independent of the underlying infrastructure. So if you, for example, uh, go to the infrastructure providers, they have different concepts to implement what a tenant is. And it's pretty common that any larger organization uh, needs to uh, split uh, you know, into different tenants. For example, based on the business units or even based on teams within the business units and so on. So you're, you're, you're looking at a tree-like structure and, and then you have users, and those users, they, they may also be, let's say, working in that business unit or in this team, but also in that team, but they with different responsibilities. So that's generally a problem that's non-trivial to solve, but there's software to do that. However, if you look into, um, let's say, for example, the, the identity provider that we choose to use for the NNS platform is Keycloak. Um, and you can create users there. You also have realms, which appears to be something like a tenant, but it actually isn't. So we decided to create a tenant service for the n platform that allows you to say, well, this is our business unit uh, XY, and you can then allow the business unit to own that Cloud Foundry organization, to own this and that Postgres instance, uh, to have access to that AWS account, and so on. So it's basically a tenant concept that's independent of the underlying services and independent of the underlying infrastructure. And then obviously you have user and group management uh, that ties into the whole thing. And um, if, if, you if you happen to have already an identity manager, you can integrate it with, uh, with that nice platform identity manager, creating shadow users as you would do integrating uh, you know, with other uh, providers. Uh, for example, as you've, you would have done with Cloud Foundry as well, in the, if that's an integration path you've ever seen. So managing tenants being infrastructure independent, that's one of the, of the challenges we've seen many times, and it's something that we are addressing. <laughs>